to see the Prime Minister. Really? <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I feel kind of lucky because I didn't have to pay $1,500 to get in here. Tom Mulcair, there it was, the line of the week actually for him, taking down the Prime Minister over the fundraising cash for access issue that still plagues his government, as does the uh, electoral reform issue, which got a new angle to it today. Andrew's here in Toronto, Chantel's in Montreal, and Rosemary Barton joins us this week from Ottawa. Um, okay, let me talk, start briefly on the cash for access. We've done this a number of times, uh, but it was another difficult week to say the least, for the government on, on this file. Chantel, where is this story? I'm not sure where it's going, but uh, if the government doesn't realize that this is not uh, an inside the beltway, inside the bubble story anymore, uh, it's not obvious that they are aware of that. What you are seeing day after day in question period is the government, including Mr. Trudeau, painting more uh, of that paint that gets them in a corner. So if they're going to come out of it rather than wear that paint, they're going to have to step over a hell of a lot of it. All right. Well, the other issue that it seems to go from blunder to blunder is the electoral reform issue. Andrew, I want your take on what happened today. And let me play for you Ron Ambrose, the Conservative leader. They've been very strong on this issue, calling for a referendum. But today, a new twist to their position. Here's what she said to Chris Hall for this week's The House. Watch this. I think everybody went into this with the right intentions in the opposition parties. Uh, one of the things that we recommended, we fought for, was a referendum. Yeah. Everyone agrees in the opposition benches from every party that a referendum has to happen before we change the way our vote is. But the government still rejects it. So I actually think they need to park this. They need to park it and set this issue aside and start to focus on other issues like job creation. Park it. Andrew, what does that do to the, uh, the whole issue right now of electoral reform? Well, it doesn't um, hold water, let's put it that way. It, it, the Conservatives have always been suspected of not wanting anything to do with electoral reform at all. Uh, they were able to paper that over by saying, well, we favor a referendum. Now they've come out perhaps a bit more in the open and saying we just we think we'd rather not do anything at all. But the notion you, can, you can't do this but also deal with the economy, it seems a bit specious. And look, what, what is the legitimate criticism is the government should get out in front and lead on this. It's fine to take the temperature of the public and send the committee around, et cetera, but at some point you have to put a, a proposal before people, gather consensus behind it, and, and you know, if put it to the people or, or, or whatever process you, you pursue. But the government's been lying back on this, spent months before they even convened the committee. Uh, at some point they've got to commit on this. Well, and you have to wonder, because the Prime Minister is saying again this week that he is keeping his promise that Canadians won't vote the same way they have before. They got some master plan they're, they're, they're not telling us about. They're trying to fake us out, Rosie, with, with the kind of blunders we've seen in the last little while. No, I mean, I, I think they are, and I've, I've thought this from the beginning, walking away very quickly from this promise. And today, Ron Ambrose threw, threw up in a window and said, here, jump. Don't, don't even worry about it anymore. So I think it's uh, become easier today for them to, to break this promise and walk it back, uh, given that uh, the reason the Conservatives don't want to talk about is, is the one that Andrew just mentioned, but also the one that Ronna Ambrose mentioned herself. They believe they get more traction and can do more damage to the government if they go after things like jobs and the economy. That's what they want to be talking about in question period. It's not the electoral reform that was probably never going to happen anyway. Chantal? Well, park it at this point would be park a wreck, because the, and, and the wreck is, is how the government drove it into a wall. Uh, Andrew is right, they could have led on this issue, but there was actually never a single real effort on the part of the Liberals to craft a consensus on achieving their promise. They, 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 they questionnaire, if you want to call it that, that they've sent out, has been ridiculed uh, from coast to coast to coast. It's going to be very hard to make anything out of it that is credible. This would have worked early on when there was a lot of goodwill on the part of some opposition parties to try to move this file forward. So if they've not been trying to sabotage it, it's actually worse because they are then really incompetent. Which one of these two issues, electoral reform, cash for access, is doing more damage or are they of uh, uh, an equal nature? Rosie? 
Uh, no, they're not of an equal nature. There are people that care about electoral reform passionately, but I would not say it's the vast majority. The cash for access becomes something that people can quickly understand. They don't have $1,500 to get into a room with the Prime Minister and have his ear for 30 seconds or two minutes or whatever he's giving these people. Um, I, I think the issue, the, the good thing for the Liberals is that this is coming to an end because the parliamentary sitting is coming to an end, uh, probably by you know December 15th. That will give them a little bit of space space away from this story and maybe a little bit of space to, to regroup around it. I don't see them actively wanting to do anything about it proactively. They are on the defensive, which is never a good thing day in and day out. Um, and I think there are some pretty easy things, pretty easy fixes that they could do that do not involve bringing back the per vote subsidy, for instance. They could be much more transparent about the fact that these are happening. That would be a good place to start. Andrew? The danger for any party is when a number of different issues congeal into one. And what's common, it seems to me, to electoral reform, to the pipelines question, to the, uh, the uh, cash for access, you, you can put all this together as kind of, well, this isn't the prime minister we thought we were electing. They, they, they said they were different. They said they were more idealistic, less cynical. And the through line of these things is it's not what we expected, and particularly for voters on the left. They've had a wonderful time for the last year basically squashing the left, the NDP, and, and sucking up all the oxygen on the left. These kinds of issues, it, it's not going to show up in the polls right now, but it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it's doing some damage to the prime minister's reputation, particularly amongst voters on the left. All right. I want to uh, switch topics to the conservative leadership debate. We saw one this week. Uh, it was held in Moncton. Um, the headline that came out of it seemed to be that, you know, four or five of the 14 uh, are not very good at French. And no, the, it's the reverse. <laughs> four or five are okay. good. Four or five are four good. Four or five are good. And, Don't and, be that and generous, the rest aren't. please. Okay, um, <laughs> that, that's your take. But, I mean, is that really the best we can say coming out of a debate for two hours of 14 people? What's it, a debate? When people, uh, there are 14 people on stage who literally get 50 seconds to each answer a question. I, if I were on that stage, I might have forgotten what candidate number one said if I'm number 12. Uh, and so, so the notion that this is anything resembling a debate uh, is not really valid. The other thing is this is clearly a, a three-tier race uh, and a lot of people who are running really don't belong on that stage. Others who are running don't seem to have any original ideas to put forward even in 50 seconds. I've exhausted my time so I'll pass it on. <laughs> well, it, you know, <laughs> I, I hate to make the American comparison but the Republicans started off with what, 17? Uh, and so they had the same kind of problem with limited time on each one and two, two or three tiers. But they had one wild card in the mix who made every one of those debates interesting. We're not, we're not seeing that happen, at least in the one we watched this week. Andrew? Yeah, we still got six months to go. Uh, so uh, this just is just six months. We're still in the winnowing stage here, and I agree. Obviously, that wasn't anything resembling a, a proper debate. But you, there was stuff you could still learn from that. We learned who was uh, halfway, you know, able to speak French or not. And as Chantel said, some of the candidates, I think, really have to look at themselves in the mirror. Even some of the leading candidates, like Kelly Leach, for example. Uh, her French is just terrible, and so it's an interesting proposition she's making. Either that she and the other candidates who can't uh, speak both languages are saying this doesn't matter, or Quebecers won't mind, or we don't need to win s seats in Quebec, or somehow I'll magically learn French in the next couple of years. All those are pretty uh, hard to, to, to believe, but that seems to be the, the premise in part of those candidacies. You also saw in terms of who was taking shots at each other, I think it's pretty clear that, that Leach uh, and uh, Maxime Bernier are among the front runners because you could see the shots being exchanged back and forth. And lo and behold, you had a candidate like Rick Peterson, for example, who shows up, who's very little known, but A, impresses with his French, and B, in the space of that very short uh, um, space that he had to talk, puts it, whether you like his idea or not, but abolishing the corporate income tax certainly got him noticed. That was something that, you, that was one more idea than we've heard from a lot of the candidates. <laughs> Rosie, is there any sense of what conservatives are looking for? Is it simply they're looking for a winner? Are they looking for a certain kind of policy? 
I, I think they're the like, I think every conservative I talk to here is, is the same as all of us right now. They're, they're looking to figure it out. They're, at this point, there are not enough differences between the candidates. You, you may have noticed, if you had to sit through it on, on Tuesday, that a lot of them were still talking about all the great things that Stephen Harper did. Well, you know, this party needs to start moving away from a record that didn't get them to win uh, and focusing on what are the different ideas that you can offer Canadians and then how do you juxtapose those against what the Liberals are doing. They aren't even doing that yet. So I, I think until they start to hear some really big differences between candidates, and I mean, you know, other than eliminating corporate taxes and pepper spray, uh, th that's going to, that's, that they're kind of stuck and feeling frustrated. Part of it's the format, but part of it is uh, what Andrew was writing about today, that some of them just don't have many ideas yet, and they're going to have to correct that pretty quickly. And part of it also I is... Think Oh, Sorry, go ahead. I, I think a lot of, of conservatives are starting to uh, feel that they should have jumped on the Rona Ambrose bandwagon mm. and pushed harder for her to run. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was pressure on her, but also on a few others to please save this uh, leadership race from itself. Uh, and I'm not sure that that's a solution, but a lot of people who saw that debate thought that it would have been wiser to push hard on Rona Ambrose to run. Andrew? Well, I, th I think part of it also is different candidates have different strategies. A lot of this is going to be about second and third choices. So you've got a candidate like uh, Michael Chong or, or Maxime Bernier where they've gone out and def defined themselves very sharply, particularly in Bernier's case. He's going to get a lot of maybe first choices for that, but how he's going to get second choices. It may be that his, his uh, selling point is going to be, I'm the person who can stop Kelly Leach. And there may be a kind of a, a way in which they feed off each other. But other candidates may be deciding, look, you know what, I'm going to not try to offend anybody, try not to define myself too sharply, hoping I'll be everybody's second choice as being less objectionable. And that may explain some of this early uh, jockeying for position that we're seeing. Well, it'll be interesting to see who comes up with the cash that's needed to keep going in this because they have to put up, uh, what was it, 50000 by the end of the year, I think, Rosie? Yeah, yeah, that's um, right. uh, Let me shift to the NDP. Nobody officially in this race yet. I mean, I know it's after the Conservatives, but it's less than a year away. What, like, what's going on? Is it, <laughs> nobody want this job, Rosie? Uh, nobody wants it right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, there's still, there are two people exploring things, Peter Julian and Charlie Angus. I'm not sure how much uh, support they're getting in terms of what they see uh, of being able to raise money. This is a party that is not doing well in the polls and is doing really horribly with fundraising right now. So for someone to jump in at this point already, knowing that the party itself is struggling to raise money, and then they're going to have to try and raise money for the leadership race, I think it's very, very daunting. Now, I did see the NDP had a Christmas party last night on Parliament Hill, and there were, you know, tons and tons of people there. So there are people inside this party still who care about it, but who wants to lead it at this stage? I, honestly, it is, it is not clear to me. Well, whoever does should get... Tom Mulcair's joke writer, because that was a great line he had. <laughs> a minute left, uh, Chantel first on, this, well, on the NDP. Well, today the Alberta NDP, the main NDP government in this country, said we're not going to be helping the New Democrats in British Columbia in their upcoming election mm -hmm. effort. Uh, and one of the strategists for Rachel Notley is, it was one of the strategists in the last BC election for the NDP, in clear at this point, you've got a schism uh, between the government of Alberta, the NDP there, and uh, the NDP on the ground that uh, is against pipelines. Quick last word, Andrew. Uh, they've had a terrible year without a permanent leader. They're divided on some of these issues. The Liberals have been stealing all the oxygen, as I said. But if, you know, politics, you have to be a bit entrepreneurial. You have to look down the road a bit. And even if it doesn't look promising now, if you wait for the sure thing, you might be waiting for the rest of your career. All right. Leave it at that. Rosie, great of you to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, uh, you're in Toronto. Chantel's in Montreal.